Is it going to be annoying if I sing the theme songs to every single one of the shows? Hi everybody, I am Michael. I'm Erica. I'm Molly. And today we are talking about TV from 1991. Ramin is so much better at this intro than I am. You don't fake the Ramin thing because it's not gonna work. Yeah, Ramin was going to join us today, but he's sick. Okay, so let's move into some new shows from 1991. This was such a fun show. And it was very low-key kind of fun. You know, two brothers that are both named Pete and their parents just having like very sort of 60s level adventures, but with like really interesting gross bits too. I remember it being kind of surreal, wasn't it? A little bit. I have a memory of this show that is very like, was that real? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I yes. mean? Okay, this was one of my faves my because, favorite. like, let me say, like, Clarissa was, and I think any girl of our generation would say this, was, like, style icon. <laughs> I, I worked very, very hard to dress like Clarissa in middle school we with the leggings do. and the yes. sweaters and the, the bright hair. colors, the yes. scrunchies, <laughs> and, oh, and she was so cool. Yeah. She was very formative, I think, for me as, like, a standard of spunky alternative coolness. My my favorite thing about Clarissa, well, one of my favorite things, is her confidence and her sort of belief in who she is in the world. That's mm -hmm. something that Pete and Pete also uh, experienced. You saw some confidence in people that we needed at that time in our lives. The other thing I loved about Sam was the fact that you have two pairs of best friends that are a male and a female. As mm -hmm. a female who always got along better with guys, I really valued seeing that on TV. And Sam was really cool in Clarissa and the, the female best friend of the older Pete whose name escapes me was also really, really cool. Yeah, on Clarissa, she would she would be like hanging out in her room and you would see the like the ladder. The la because you always climb up the ladder. <laughs> yes. That was it was great fun. I loved her whole thing with her little brother Ferguson and how they yeah. drove each other crazy. Her parents were like super annoying, but they were incredibly good characters. Like if you go watch that later on, there was a lot of really good character development in that show that you don't always see. Ten out of ten for Clarissa. <laughs> I loved Clarissa. There's a lot of people who knocked this show. People didn't actually look at how creative and inventive it was. It was one of the earliest shows in addition to like Alf. Oh, who greenlit Alf? That used puppetry as a primary means of communication and getting across comedy. They had a lot of magnificent voice actors. They had a ton of catchphrases. They had a prime time spot, which you don't often get. And it had a lot of really good creativity in the music and how they were just developing this Americana story by dinosaurs. Like, I would watch it today and it's still funny. I do feel like this is very much in the vein of who greenlit Alf, but it was a huge, a huge hit show. Yeah. I remember watching mm -hmm. it because I thought it was fascinating. I've never missed an episode. Mm -hmm. And everybody, everybody, everybody was saying, not the mama, <laughs> right? Like, not I, the mama, not the mama. I'm I'm still the saying that. Yeah. I'm the baby, gotta love me. <laughs> yes, I forgot that one. <laughs> oh, it was such a bizarre show. The puppetry is really impressive in that, with like large scale puppetry happening. Was there impo important voice acting happening on that show that I wasn't aware of? There's... Stuart Pankin, Alan Troutman, Jessica Walter! People... Okay, we have to talk about Jessica Walter being in Dinosaurs! <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Walter kind of always played Jessica Walter, but was always incredible at it. <laughs> Wait, so was she the mom in Dinosaurs? Yeah. Wait. Weren't they all different species of dinosaur? I what was so. that about? I remember that there was a big deal about the final episode of Dinosaurs because it's like, okay, well, yeah. we're going to go extinct now because the asteroid's coming, and it was, like, weirdly dark. Yes. So um, are we talking about Nicktoons? Yes. So in 1991, Nickelodeon introduced the Nicktoons lineup, which was Doug Rugrats... Ren and Stimpy. These ended up becoming like iconic, I think for our generation, like childhood cartoon shows. What was interesting about these that I just learned is that in the 80s, late 80s, well, I guess throughout the 80s, you had a lot of the, the sort of Saturday morning cartoons that our generation grew up with were all sort of 
funded by toy companies. So like the, they were to sell the toy. So you had G.I. Joe and then you had the G.I. Joe cartoon. You had He-Man and then you had the He-Man cartoon. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, I was about to say. Right, these Nicktoons, these three cartoon shows were creator driven and they they were not about selling toys. They were just about storytelling. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and creating these characters. The success of the Nicktoons lineup led Nickelodeon's parent company Viacom to want to introduce similarly creator-driven cartoon shows on one of its other well-known cable networks, which was MTV. <laughs> and so that was how we got, you know, Beavis and Butthead and Daria and some of those. It's interesting thinking about what toys for dog rugrats and ren and snippy would look like you can't really make toys out of these well you could have a log <laughs> <laughs> everyone needs a log yes and it was and it, you had the pencil right he like drew himself at the mm -hmm. beginning yeah. quail man yes <laughs> <laughs> Such an easy costume for Halloween, and, and people do it, but it, it's it's great every time. <laughs> yes, yeah. I shipped Doug and Patty mayonnaise. I always thought it was really fun how the skin colors worked on Doug, because yes. you had some people who had, you know, skin colors that you see and real people, and then mm -hmm. some people were blue or green also. <laughs> yeah, and it was one of the first, well, not one of the first, but one of the more important ideas of, of diversity. Mm -hmm. on these cartoons that we saw because it wasn't like glaringly in your face this is about race it was just saying everybody's different colors yeah. and it's totally cool and it's just part of who we are also with character designs there's the whole idea of like round shapes are friend shapes and angular shapes are enemy shapes mm -hmm. oh i didn't know this in in, car in, in a lot of design and i guess um, that makes sense so like roger uh, is like a triangle basically yes yeah. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the other thing about these shows is like that they were really good. Like they were good yeah. shows. They had interesting stories and, and good plot lines. And like you kind of never missed an episode. Good music. Good Bang music. it on a trash can. <laughs> Ren and Stimpy was also sort of revolutionary, I think, as far as like you know, gross out cartoons go. I understand the appeal <laughs> of Ren and Stimpy, but I just always hated it. I me never too. wanted to watch any of it. It just I, grossed I, me out too much. I enjoyed like the first season of it, but it did get too gross and I could only stomach so much of it, even as a kid. Yeah, but you sang the log song, so. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think with Ren and Stimpy, it was a show that like older people liked. And so I felt like, like my brother, my brother is six years older than me. He liked it. So I wanted to like it so that I would see him like, because there must've been something sophisticated and cool about it if older guys liked it no it was just like stone Red and Stimpy yeah. is sophisticated <laughs> yeah, I, know. I see the insanity of that comment okay thank you very much I think part of what made Rugrats so great is Angelica being yes. at times a villain at times really sympathetic mm -hmm. she's just a real seemingly real bratty kid I love to the parents on Rugrats yeah. because they all felt very real to me also. That's because they gave them personality. They weren't just like a shadow in the background like a lot of shows focused on kids. They each had character. Tommy, his family was Jewish and they celebrated Hanukkah and then there was the one with the glasses that was afraid of everything. Chucky. Yeah. I loved Chuck. And then his mom was like the, no, it was the twins' mom that was like the crazy feminist. Yeah. Well, Not the, crazy they, feminist, but like cool feminist. With they, the, well, always wore sweatpants. I saw something on Twitter recently that was talking about the parents on Rugrats and thinking like, when you were a kid watching this, they all looked so old. But if you look up the age of the characters, the age they're supposed to be, they're all in their mid-30s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking about the parents looking back? And I didn't think this at the time, but I'm thinking it when I'm sort of thinking about what the characters look like in my mind's eye. Is that like, oh, like the dad always had like a five o'clock shadow, like uh, Tommy's dad. Like he was like always tired. He was always exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> and he had like bags under his eyes. And I, I, I remember shots of him like, cooking in the kitchen wearing only underwear. Yes. Like that. Yeah. The other side of realizing that we're actually older than them now, these people feel like our friends now. Reptar, reptar, <laughs> gotta find a reptar. <laughs> that show aside from the teen heartthrob of it all like i don't know that show was necessarily for us 
No. I mean, I guess it was like a family show. Yeah, but it, was like, meant, it was meant to be family, but it was meant to have that sort of masculine drive behind it. I feel like a lot of the like hyper masculinity stuff on that show. I always had the sense that it was kind of tongue in cheek. Like it was making fun of it. Like, oh, look, he's just obsessed with cars and tools and making grunting sounds. Yeah. With, um, and the, the blonde walking around and tool, during the tool time segments. Like, mm-hmm. like the, the, yeah. I think it was making fun of that. Of to, that culture. To, to yeah. some extent. With which of the sons was your uh, Tiger Beat uh, pinup poster? None of them. Yeah, I was not into any of them. Oh, I had a whole JTT face. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because I tend to not really like girly guys now. But um, he, and he was definitely known for having like shiny golden locks. first <laughs> <laughs> is this all me am i the one that spent all my days homesick watching uh people take paternity tests on maury povich in 1991 i was nine years old and even then when i would see these shows like not in my ninth year but you know shortly thereafter I just saw that this was trash from the very beginning, and I just never got into trash TV. It was good, exemplary trash TV for those who were into it. I don't blame those people. Although I will say that the thing I liked about Montel Williams was that there was just a little bit more sincerity and a little more actually wanting to help people. You know, I am not so highfalutin. I did not recognize it as tra- trash TV. I thought it was very important journalism that was <laughs> happening on these shows. I thought they were just as good as Oprah. And yeah, I really did want to know who was the father of that baby. <laughs> you cheated on me. Uh, we're going to bring out the guy that, and we're going to have a fight start on stage and all of that stuff that the J- Jerry Springer show like became really famous for was like those all out brawls mm-hmm. on set. And the ways that the producers would try and stoke that as much as they can. As like, much as they could. Like get them riled up backstage before they come out. Like, they would have these like guys on staff that were big burly guys that were there. Their job was just to break up fights, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? You know, but you had to let them fight just enough for the cameras without anybody like actually getting hurt. Camp on Awana, we hold you in our hearts, and when we think about you, it makes me want to (laughs) fart. Oh, salute your shorts. Awful Waffles and Summer Camp. And I just loved the Nickelodeon lineup at this time so much. And Salute Your Shorts was just dead center of that for me. We related to this stuff when we were kids, and it was just so fun to see the shenanigans and the and the stuff that they could get into just from going to summer camp together. It was a lot of shenanigans on Nickelodeon back in those days, wasn't mm-hmm. it? And I love that they were at summer camp forever, it seemed. Because like I went to summer camp every year for one week. You didn't have time to get into these yeah. kinds of shenanigans or build these kinds of relationships with people or, or you know, enmities as the case may be. <laughs> Every one of those characters was so great. And Ugg was the only like, adult that was there on a regular basis but he was just one of the kids like everybody else and then you had bobby budnick and you had sponge and i Telly, don't remember any like, of their names i'm so glad you remember them oh my god this was so formative for me and all of this humor just just rings in my head you know the writing on those shows back then on nickelodeon mm-hmm. was really good yeah if i'm thinking about it, the more i think about it and look back on these shows they were good yeah <laughs> and you know it also had a real deep running element of of dealing with school bullying not in any kind of really enlightened way but especially salute your shorts there was a lot of bullying and a lot of dealing with that bullying and standing up to them because budnick was was roger klotz on this show and he was a jerk to everybody he tormented a lot of people but you could see that he had some little tiny bit of heart every once in a while i never watched it <laughs> <laughs> Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? <laughs> we didn't plan that. I loved this show so much. It was such a fun, interesting game show. I knew I would kill if I could be on that show. Oh my God, I was so into it. I'm terrible at geography. I paid more attention in geography because of it. <laughs> Honestly. I remember watching it a lot and I remember really liking the chief. Was that her name? What yeah. Was, it, it, was he just the chief? chief? Okay. And uh, yeah, of course, Rockapella. The most famous act that I've ever opened for in concert. <laughs> <laughs> Did your schools have um, like a computer game version of it on, yeah. installed on the computers on, on the little Macs that they had? I had a Carmen San Diego board game. I loved all of the names 
of Carmen's underlings. Oh, yeah. All right, well, that's it for new shows. We can now move on to games. Oh, no. Erica's well, going to knock down Dragon. This is Nielsen ratings, so... so this most watched. Most watched. Okay. Listed are all of the shows that are in the running, things that we've talked about, things that are still on the air. Since Erica won the last one, let's have Molly start. Okay, so I get to go first, and I'm going to say the number one highest rated show in... 1991 to 1992 was Roseanne. Roseanne was on the list. She was number two. All right, so Molly gets nine points to Erica. I'm out for blood this time. (laughs) I'm going to say Cheers. Cheers was one of the ones tied for number four. God, I feel like this list is really befuddling to me because, like, they all stand out as shows that would be popular and influential, but none of them stand out as, like, this is the show that everybody was watching and had like water cooler conversations, you know? I think I'm gonna make my guess and my guess is gonna be Home Improvement. Home Improvement was the other number four. High ratings right away, which is surprising. Full House. Full House was number seven. You know, I said it was a huge fucking show and I don't know who greenlit Alf, but (laughs) um, I think Dinosaurs. Nope, no dinosaurs. 60 Minutes? 60 Minutes was number one. I'm going to say Coach. Coach was number 10. Murder, She Wrote? Murder was number 8. I always overlook Murder, She Wrote. I always forget how popular the grandma demographic is. (laughs) Don't think you would have put it on here if it wasn't on the list. And actually, there's two of those that I'm thinking that about. And I think the one that I feel like is more likely to be higher up is Murphy Brown. Murphy Brown was number 3. Nice call, Molly. Designing Women? Designing Women was number six. Okay. Major Dad. And yeah, Major Dad was number nine. Thank you. Okay, close one, but Erica clinched it. Molly, you did so good. (laughs) And you completed the board, so it's it's been a while since we've completed a board in anything. Woohoo! All right, so anything sticking out to anybody about anything. So we talked about Nickelodeon with the three original content cartoons. We talked about the talk shows where they exploited people. Where's Oprah right now? Has is she, she? She has her own show still. Okay. It hasn't become the behemoth that it would become. Yeah. Well, I think it's still probably popular, but like not being one of the top ten most watched shows mm-hmm. doesn't mean it's not a highly watched show. No, uh, no, I know. With the other talk shows, Maury and um, Montel Williams and Jerry Springer, I feel like in the early 90s, that was a space that was sort of created by Oprah, right? And then you had other people sort of chasing that. And then eventually you would end up with all these other daytime talk shows, like... Uh, there was Ricky Lake had a show, right? Uh, there was the Rosie O'Donnell show that is going to come down the line. Um, that Rosie O'Donnell, I think, made way for Ellen, right? Mm-hmm. Who, you know, then made way for, like, Kelly Clarkson to have a show, right? These, like, these shows where you had... Because originally you had Oprah, who was a journalist. Jerry Springer, who was a journalist. Wanta Williams, I'm pretty sure, was a journalist. And then, and then they're going into this space where they're feeling like their talk show, they're doing journalism, Right? At first, at least. You know, they're, they're talking to real people about their lives. I think we've covered this pretty well, and we made good time. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Ooh, that's right. You can see my new end card again. So to Molly's side, there will be a video that, that YouTube thinks you would like. Up here is the button you can click to... <laughs> <laughs> Up here is the button that you can click to uh, uh, subscribe to the channel. Please leave a comment if you have any thoughts on any of these shows or any other shows that we missed from 1991. Uh, please like the video. Uh, please do a dance for me. And um, yeah, maintain your groovy selves. Maintain your groovy selves. Bye.